right, good morning. So we, we all know that we are in trouble, we are living in a non-sustainable world and basically it means this is about life and death situations and we really need to change the system, right? Our economy in the first place and we all know it should be a circular economy, but why don't we have it yet? Apparently the institutions that we have to fix this problem, you know, we've all seen this graphic presentation over here, you know, we're overusing the resources of this planet. The institutions that were supposed to fix it have basically failed to do it in time. And what are those institutions? Oh, first of all, global corporations, international trade, right? I mean, we know since the early 70s that we would have a sustainability problem. But since then, resource consumption, energy consumption has skyrocketed. You know, we, we were still sustainable back in the early 70s. Now, this is the situation that occurred since then. You know, so corporations haven't fixed it. Nation states and the United Nations have tried. They also couldn't fix it. And so we need new institutions, right? Additional complementary institutions. And the question is, what would be pillar three? A data-driven AI control society, maybe? I mean, that's something that has been built basically since at least 2001, right? And maybe you've heard this quote by CIA director Gus Hunt, otherwise it's time. You're already a walking sensor platform, he said, right? So you're Digital devices basically are collecting a hell lot of data about you. You may not know about it, but it's happening. And the CIS is collecting it and running intelligence algorithms over it. And they don't tell us uh, what exactly they're doing with it, but you know, it sounds pretty concerning for sure. Uh, since Edward Snowden, we know that not only companies are collecting a hell lot of data, but Secret services on top of all are collecting all the company's data, right? And then a dream came up by Chris Anderson who said, oh, if you just have enough data, then basically we don't need science anymore. So well, we can go home, basically, right? Well, this was back in 2008. And what's your feeling about the state of the world? Has it improved since then? Or do we all the time hear climate emergency, corona emergency, 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 emergency? So, you know, everything has, according to propaganda, become better and better. But now we are in the state of the emergency. Come on, I mean, something is not logical here, right? Well, certainly you can use big data to run systems, no question, right? And so the big data algorithms that have been developed for analysis of elementary particles, like at CERN, have eventually been generalized and applied to chicken farms, pig farms, animal farm, you know, comes to mind, of course, and then uh, to hunt terrorists and criminals, to get jobs, or get unemployed into jobs and uh, then we have seen the citizen score, social credit score in China and so the question is would we all be governed by big data and controlled by AI? You know that's the kind of outcome that can happen. We've seen these pictures recently. It's a logical consequence of any totalitarian system, also technological totalitarianism. You know, something that has been sold to us as a digital paradise in a sense, but you can see it over there to the top left, the bestseller by Nobel Prize winner Richard Stala, the swarm, the flock of birds that we see is actually a formation, you know, it's almost like a crystal and everybody has to be in his or her place and anybody who deviates is misbehaving and that misbehavior has to be fixed. This is the flock of birds according to Richard Tyler and that is a flock of birds that we see in nature, you know. We've all been amazed by this. How, how do they do this, you know? Airplanes cannot do it despite modern technology and there is no lead bird over here 
no Führer who tells all the others what to do. This is self-organization, right? And that's why I'm basically suggesting Computer 3 should be based on digitally assisted self-organization, right? And we should orient at nature. Nature is a highly efficient, um, highly sustainable uh, material uh, supply system. And so we could learn a lot from nature, right? And nature, however, is a self-organizing system. So what I'm trying to say is society cannot be steered like a car by a centralized control center, no matter how much data you have, you know, it's just a bad idea. If you have a single car, of course, you can control it. But if you have many cars interacting with each other, then basically what you get is emergent trouble. This is an instability which causes stop and go traffic. Traffic jams a very undesirable outcome, something that we can understand with social physics, as was pointed out, so there are mathematical formulas to model this and understand why this is happening. And as we understand it also, we can learn how to fix this. So the reason for the traffic jam is actually that there is an on-ramp, and so there are a few cars trying to sneak in the freeway that's uh, disrupting the order on the freeway, these small disruptions are being amplified by a chain reaction, basically, and that creates a stop and go traffic. Now, if we would equip those cars with radar sensors, for example, that measure distances and relative velocities, and that the cars accelerate and decelerate according to a slightly different algorithms, then you can see that the traffic jam is disappearing, even though the same number of cars is entering the freeway. So how have we done this, basically? Not with a centralized traffic control approach. No, it was all decentralized. The only thing that we've done is we have done real-time measurement, we've given real-time feedback, we have slightly changed the interactions between the cars. And so the self-organization of those cars has resulted in a different outcome in an outcome that was desirable. So if you just have the right kinds of interactions and mechanism design can help us to find those kinds of interactions, then basically we'll get the desirable outcome for free. It results by self-organization like magic, you know. So what do you want more? Uh, so there would be a new paradigm from top-down control to self-organizing systems. So how to get rid of this mess? Well, actually, I've been in Egypt, and surprisingly, I found this at one intersection, pretty close to the Gizeh pyramids, actually. And uh, you can see this is self-organized, and there is no traffic jam, even though there's really a highly diverse crowd of traffic participants. What's the reason for this working so well? It's... Uh, smart design. We have unidirectional flow in the front, opposite unidirectional flow in the back, and a buffer in between that allows everyone to adjust the speed in such a way that there would be a gap in the traffic flow once you want to cross it. And of course, we don't want everyone to honk and make a lot of noise as this is happening in Cairo, but we have silent digital technology that allows us to make the invisible hand work 300 years after Adam Smith using the Internet of Things but not collecting all the data in one place but just giving local feedback that's the idea and so we've been inspired by pedestrian flows mentioned before here at interest uh, at bottlenecks you can see there is an oscillatory flow emerging without any traffic signs, without any policemen, without any laws and regulations. This is based on a pressure principle. We can understand that as a physical phenomenon and intersections in traffic flow are bottlenecks too. So the idea was that we could co come up with a self-organized oscillation that we could use to define traffic lights 
That means the traffic flows would control the traffic lights bottom up rather than the other way around. And it turns out that this is actually more efficient, believe it or not. Uh, traffic control center doesn't do a better job. And that's pretty amazing. And if this is the case because it's a complex optimization problem that you cannot strictly solve in real time. But a lot of the problems that we are faced with in the world are of this kind. And that's why self-organization could be the solution. <coughs> so how do we apply this to the world altogether? Well, <coughs> City Olympics could be a way. Turn cities into innovation motors. Create networks of cities that would learn from each other and help each other. So basically, there would be different disciplines, like uh, improving energy efficiency, reducing climate change, reducing energy consumption, making our cities more resilient, more sustainable, more peaceful, more social, you know, whatever. These would be different disciplines. Cities would engage into a friendly competition with each other. And we know that competition raises uh, the level of outcome, so we will all be better. And it's fun, actually, but it's not about winning, actually. This is about motivating, engaging, mobilizing people. It's also about bringing a new way of cooperation on the way, because the solutions that would be developed by the cities, with all the stakeholders on board, including civil society, would paid by taxes, um, would then be open source and creative commons. So any city could take any of those solutions developed around the world to implement it in their city, depending on their budget, culture, whatever context, they could just choose the best solution that fits their situation. Like companies could take those solutions, develop them further, could combine those solutions with each other. So here you see, how we can mobilize collective intelligence of all the cultures, of all the cities around the world to make progress together in those different disciplines that matter in order to make the planet more sustainable, for example. So the new paradigm would be localization rather than globalization. So we should think global, yes, but we should act local and diverse. We should experiment. We should learn from each other, we should help each other. And we have actually run a small version of the City Olympics, and this was called the Climate City Cup last year. And a lot of this was basically inspired by the open innovation formats that we run, hackathons, such as this blockchain and Internet of Things school. You can see more, I believe, more than 100 uh, students over here. Uh, many of them from countries all over the world, and they've really come up with amazing ideas. And we've taken it further. So you know, the city hackathon is basically the city cup, right? And uh, we have even developed our own hardware, as you can see over here. These are measurement devices to measure air quality um, quite accurately, actually. And uh, so basically, people could take them on their bike tours through the city or whatever they're doing and measure the quality of air. And then, of course, cities should be engaged in making an effort to improve that quality because there would also be a competitive discipline to make progress in terms of applying new solutions. And of course, there's an app and there's a collection of data and the evaluation of data and so on and so on. So basically, yes, digital assistants are a way to boost self-organization. And we've been working on platforms for digital democracy, for example, Empower Polis is one of them. Drippinet or InfluenzaNet, you know, is kind of pretty up to date, you could say, uh, given the corona crisis. This, this is for kind of self-information of the population, right? Not controlled by a government or by the company, but this is an information system run by the citizens for the citizens. And same thing with 
nervous net, for example. You can see it's quite a lot of fun. And uh, one of our team members, Yukdeep is his name from India. He has uh, been working on a social mirror to support behavioral change. So basically he's evaluating all the data he's collecting about his own life to show him how he's doing in terms of achieving his own goals, right? Not the goals of government or uh, Google or whoever, but his own goals. And we've uh, developed a similar app um, in the ACID project for a more responsible, more sustainable consumption. Here again, the consumers, the citizens are telling the device what are their values, their preferences in terms of environment, health, social, whatever, you know, ingredients, allergies, and so on. And then the app would figure out for them among all the products offered in a particular shop what would be the products fitting his or her preferences best and in fact as you can see over here it will make people change their behavior and that is actually of course making uh, consumption more sustainable it's also interesting for uh, uh, companies, by the way, because they can sell products at a higher price, higher quality products, of course, right? Now, we want to go a step further, right? So, we need to make the world more sustainable. And at the moment, in, in industrial countries like Germany, uh, we are basically wasting 50 tons of materials in a lifetime. You know, these are cars, these are uh, tables, furniture, computers, smartphones, all sorts of things that other people could actually still use. So the question is, how can we reduce this? How can we build a circular economy? And I think the Internet of Things can help if we use it the right way. Actually, we even have it in the pocket, right, with our smartphones. The issue is just to have a self-controlled use of that kind of data. So we should build our own measurement system. We've tried to do that, called NervousNet. Uh, we've even had a nature publication about this, uh, Build Digital Democracy. Uh, apparently it was not uh, a good idea because um, there were quite a few people who got me in, in trouble for basically challenging this centralized control paradigm. And anyway, the idea is out there. And so the idea is to take it further, basically to measure noise and CO2 and all sorts of externalities and air quality and so on with our own devices, right? To be in control ourselves and then to create real-time feedback to allow for real-time coordination. And for this, basically, we would want to increase positive externalities to reduce negative ones and to ensure fair compensation. How to do this? You know, basically, we're running our own money system, right? And that can be done with blockchain technology now. The main point, however, is not to replace dollars by um, like Ethereum or whatever, you know, a one dimensional physical or fiat currency by a cryptocurrency. But the point is that we need a different kind of system and a different kind of thinking, right? And um, what we want to do is basically we want to be able to inject new kind of forces in our economy that would support self-organization towards social and environmental goals, right? At the moment, we have a system of profit maximization. That means everyone wants to do something for the environment, but in the end, there's competition, right? And those who save money on environmental issues they will have bigger profits and they will expand more quickly. And that's why those companies who care more about the environment will basically grow slower. This is never going to work. So we need additional incentives and comp uh, incentive systems, com com compensation systems for those companies who engage in environmental issues and sustainability in social issues and those things that we care about, culture too. And with these new additional forces that we can create through a multi-dimensional 
feedback system, we would have forces that would eventually, through a process of co-evolution, come up with a circular economy. I mean, everyone would do a little improvement, but as these forces would basically help coordinate all this, it would end up with a circular economy and a sharing economy. Now, finally, I'd want to discuss a bit more why a multidimensional approach is needed and why this is the big paradigm change. You know. This is really what matters, I believe. Now, society is made up of many different institutions, as you know, right? So there's health, there's education, there's a political system, there's a justice system, uh, there's, of course, business and so on and so on. And traditionally, these different areas of our society have had different goals. Because we know that you know, just maximizing money will not do it. With the digitization, actually, this has changed. The digital revolution has entered every single field of our society, and now basically profit maximization um, is entering all fields of our society, you know, here, so everything comes together in a city, of course, but then the huge complexity of what is going on in the city is then projected on one dimension, which is money. And why is this done? Because otherwise you cannot optimize, and optimization is the basis of running businesses, right? If you want to optimize, you need to compare two solutions. You need to figure out what is better, what is worse. And this is simple in a one-dimensional system where you have greater and smaller operations. So basically, that is the reason for all the problems of our world, that the complexity of this world is projected in one dimension. And we haven't been very efficient in this in the past with this digital revolution. Now, we can now do this projection. And basically, it resulted in a very utilitarian approach that goes so far that some people would now basically adjust a price to human organs and even a single life and give every person a single a personal value. This is utilitarian thinking, you know. We, we are a commodity by now of this capitalist utilitarian system. We have been turned from subjects into objects. It's not only bad for us, it's also bad for the environment, it's, it's bad for everything because uh, we don't want to live in a one-dimensional world. It's not going to work. Right, so we, we need to have a multi-dimensional approach. There's so many goals that we really have. It's not just prosperity, it's sustainability, it's health, it's education, it's culture, but optimization neglects all goals but one. And if you now say, oh, we're in trouble, you know, like GDP per capita has brought us into this situation of climate emergency. Let's take another goal function. Then 30 years later, you will be in the same kind of trouble and figure out that, oh, we've forgotten about everything else. So it's the optimization thinking that is bringing us there. We're creating, apparently, a paradise. Optimization is uh, supposed to be creating a better, a better system, you know, and finally a paradise. But in fact, just the opposite is, is, is happening because we're using the wrong paradigm. Is this clear? Because that's going to change everything, you know. Our entire economy is basically run based on the wrong, wrong principles, right? So if we have this one-dimensional thinking of less and more, this optimization thinking, now naturally what results is top and down. Uh, some people are on the top of society, some are on the bottom. So a hierarchical society results sooner or later, you want it or not. But you know, this kind of hierarchical military kind of society. This is not working well for complex system, as I said. No. But today, supply networks are organized this way, right? And then you look into nature and how our body works 
and it looks like this. Totally different, you know. How could we ever make this mistake? You know, why did we learn from this? Apparently, it's not hierarchically organized. But nature is so much more efficient in terms of reusing, recycling resources and so on. There's no waste, basically. Everything is being reused. It's amazing, you know, just we need to learn from nature, that's it. And then the question, how does nature work? There's no such thing as money. We're not just living on one thing, say water. We need carbohydrates, we need proteins, we need vitamins, we need minerals. And many of those things are not replaceable for each other. It's a multidimensional feedback system. And it works wonderfully, you know. Do you really need to make complicated calculations to figure out how to move your toe or your arm or make your digestion work or whatever? You know? So all a self-organized system, it's amazing. You don't need to have a centralized control. You know, the entire immune system is decentralized. It's not co controlled by a control center like the brain. And, um, and that has a reason, actually, because it makes it more resilient. If there's a center, you can attack it, and then that's it, you know. We're being attacked all the time by bacteria and viruses, you know. And astonishingly enough, we're on average surviving kind of 80 years or so, 70, 80 years. So uh, this decentralized self-organizing system is highly efficient, highly robust. Right? <clears throat> so with a multidimensional value exchange system, there are many more possibilities to find solutions that benefit all. The space of possible solutions is significantly increased. We know that we're living in ecosystems, right? In these ecosystems, there's an exchange of resources. Some of these species are good at producing A, some of them are good at producing B, but they're exchanging some of that stuff, actually. Our own body is made up of a lot of different species. In our digestion organs, there are millions of bacteria. And you know, in previous decades, we would want to get rid of them because it's a bacteria. Ooh, no. Um, but in, in fact, they're doing a good job for us. They're basically getting all those resources out from the food, but also they're producing immunity to a lot of things. So it's, we are an ecosystem. It's 10 times more bacteria in our body than body cells. Just imagine that. We're an ecosystem. And so uh, the question, how can we learn from this? You know? How do we overcome tragedies of the commons and for the, the projector is not very good, but on the left you see basically no trees, on the right there's still trees. So apparently social organization can change things a lot, as Elinor Ostrom, for example, has shown. Now at the moment, of course, we have this one-dimensional money system, right? Suppose everyone, three people over here, has a certain amount of coins, you see in black, now, if, if everyone would pass on one coin to another person, you know, the situation wouldn't change. This exchange of money in the system couldn't motivate people to make an effort for anything. However, if we had different kinds of coins, coins for materials, coins for social things, coins for environmental things, whatever, you know, can have a thousand different coins, but I'm just illustrating this for three different kinds of coins and three people. Then basically what you can do is you can have an exchange. So everyone is passing on one coin of those kind of coins that there's most of to the next person. And then through this, basically you get a different kind of situation where those different kinds of coins are better distributed, more equally distributed. And that's good because, you know, if you go shopping, you basically need all the three coins in future to pay for your stuff, depending on, you know, how socially and environmental friendly the products have been produced, right? So 
this situation is better than that situation over there. And so, as it's not possible to exchange those coins at the stock market frictionless, there is a motivation for people now to engage into an interaction that would be associated with such an exchange of coins. So basically, you know, the idea is to turn win-lose situations that have been exploitative situations in the past into win-win situations by um, this money exchange, but a multidimensional money exchange. So we, we could find different ways to engage different people with different talents and interests in order to make a contribution to a better world. And that would create an information innovation production ecosystem that we would all benefit from, right? So the success principles for a complex world, success principles for the future would be co-learning, co-creation, coordination, cooperation, and co-evolution. And you can be a game changer. I think it's actually not so difficult to create a better world together. We now have the technology to make this difference. And uh, here's, by the way, a free of charge book about uh, the Fin4 system. So if you want to read a little bit more, then you can find it here. Thanks.